Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Savvy Entrepreneur. Today, we have one of our previous guests with us, Marta Lochamin, fresh off her victory in her primary. So we're going to be discussing a whole range of topics around government and policy. So without further ado, this is Marta. Marta, how are you doing today? Hi, tell us. I'm doing well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me back. It's great to see you. First, I'd like to congratulate you on your victory. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just you know reiterate. My name is Martha Lochamin, and the primary victory that that you're uh, referring to is the June 30th primary, state and local here in Colorado, and locally for us, the Boulder County Commissioner District Two uh, primary race. So thank you for that. So yeah, let's uh, talk about what it was like to run and win an election during a pandemic, and what your plans are for the general election. Sure, yeah. So running a primary, um, that was one of, and we, you know, we've talked just a, a little bit, that that was one of the more challenging career uh, pieces I've done, really, from, from a couple different levels. I and mean, one, it's the most public job interview that one could ever do. Um, I started the campaign over 18 months ago. So knowing that it was a long runway, as people say, um, to build. I really look at it and, and thought about it from the perspective of building a business, because it's some of those same steps that we as entrepreneurs use to, you know, create your idea and really focus in, like, what are you going to hone in on and who are you going to bring on your team and what is the strategic priorities and your timelines and all those pieces. So I really, um, you know, kind of considered it from, from that perspective. And running in a primary, uh, what people talk about as far as politics is very real, even locally. And I think people will be super fascinated about what that really looks like for us in Boulder County. And, um, you know, as we talked about June 30th, the, the primary results at that 703 initial numbers were very close. Um, and at, at that time, I told my team, no one's going to sleep. And we were all exhausted those last probably 72 hours prior to um, I'll tell you, at 6.15 on the night of June 30th, the night of the primary, I was still making personal phone calls. And a, a gentleman answered the phone. He's like, oh, yeah, this is perfect timing. I just sat down. I was going to fill out my ballot and go drop it off. And that I share because we're coming up to a November 3rd election. We need to help our friends and neighbors get out the vote and make sure people know that the sooner that they do vote, the less phone calls they'll get from candidates like me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we also have a real duty, I believe, in the United States, specifically here in Colorado, to show what mail-in and drop-off ballot can do. And so the sooner that we do that, the earlier we do that when ballots go out in October, on October 9th, truly is a way for us to show and demonstrate that it is a safe system, that it is a way that we can all participate in this democratic process as we move along in the U.S. So that's not exactly what you you asked, but I think that's one of the really important pieces of this conversation. Um, and also, when you talk about, okay, what's the move from primary to general? It is a different race now. Um, and remember, I'm a first-time candidate, so this has all been new. And adding in COVID and the pandemic and losing jobs and uh, going digital, it was a lot of different transitions. And I also believe that no matter how steep the challenge feels, when we talk about serving community, uh, it's always going to be a, a little steep. And I personally just have that in me that uh, this is more about personal responsibility and community than it is about um, the left, the heavy lift or the, the weight behind the the task to get there. So, yeah, you bring up a really good point with the mail in ballots. I've seen our Secretary of State on multiple TV sh uh, news programs talking about how Colorado has had a mail system for many years and it's worked exceedingly well. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's really fascinating. I think this, the National Vote Project and that work. And, you know, listening like you're talking about in the news, some of this pushback that we're getting around the country and the fact that, unfortunately, it's becoming what seems like a partisan issue when the reality is, is that it is to vote it is one of the most democratic actions that we all can take in 
in in our country of origin um, for folks who are you know voting outside of, of the U.S., but also for citizens here in the U.S. to be able to participate. And we talk about different levels of voice, what that looks like. And we've shown in Colorado, as you already mentioned, you know, now for um, for years that 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 is a way that's accessible and a way for people to be able to participate. And I think the other piece there is that a lot of times uh, folks feel like their voice isn't heard in an election, but realize that in local elections, like we just saw in the primary, um, the difference of 15 votes is literally like this little part of the street that I live on. My 15 neighbors could make a difference for my race or for your race in the future or, you know, other folks who, and, and I, I feel like that's an important conversation that's not really shared. Um, and we tend to think about really big state races or big national races. And, and then it does feel like, oh, yeah, my one vote might not make a difference. And in reality, it's the practice of and the education of and making sure people know that participating has a real profound effect. Right. So get out there and vote, everyone. So another thing that's really important to us here in Boulder County is renting. A large portion of the people here in this county rent, and you know, rent has been going up pretty steadily since I've been here in 2014. Do you want to talk about some of the initiatives you're planning on doing in order to combat rent inflation? Yeah, I mean, uh, let me give a little bit of background, especially for folks who might be listening or watching from other areas, that in Boulder County, from a county perspective, and we have 330,000 residents in Boulder County, 45% of our residents are renters. In the city of Boulder, it's 55%. And so uh, we have, when you talk about renting, and I think that's helped kind of people figure out, you know, how does that feel? And the other piece that is happening nationally and also here in our county is the reality of not just renting, but also spending more than 30% of your income on your rent. And so that's another, you know, kind of topic of the conversation. But just from the the piece of rent, one, there's a need, obviously, because we have such a great portion of our community that rents. Um, and we can kind of talk about the different pieces of that. But maybe that background for people is is at least helpful. So do you think that promoting home ownership is a good way to combat this? Or do you think that uh, keeping prices rent down is the better way? Depends what your outcome, you know, where are you going and what are you looking for? So my background is is focused on on home ownership. Uh, I'm talking mm-hmm. about my, you know, 20 years of career plus and also a lot of my nonprofit work um, with the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. That's what we focus on is sustainable home ownership. And people ask me a lot, like, what does that mean? But the, the idea of sustainable means that we as advocates of housing advocate for and look for and create different types of the different steps to get to home ownership. So it might be like you're talking about renting. I mean, there's a need, yeah, just with the data I just shared, there's a need. And there's also this need for affordable rentals. Uh-huh. Meaning, and, and that can look like very different, you know, different ways of affordable rental. It could look like deed restricted housing which we have some of that here in Boulder County as well. Um, We can talk about a little more specifics too, if you want to. Ultimately, I believe what we're missing in Boulder County is entry-level housing Um, because someone like you and I who want to get our foot in the door, literally, it's not just the price, but it's that what I tell clients all the time is when you're buying a car, typically it's not the first time you buy a car. It's not typically the car you're hoping you have forever. It's the A to B and the A to B and the A to B to start and home ownership. In my mind, should we need to provide some more opportunities for folks to start with something like that, translate it uh-huh. into housing, um, and then move on and, and you know as, as different things, um, you know, life changes, right? Yeah, that's such a good point because you know someone might not be able to afford the average home in Boulder, but might be able to down the road and between then between then and where they are at this point in time, if they were to buy a house for 200 something thousand, then they could be saving their equity and not just throwing it away into someone else's mortgage, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the piece of, you're right. I mean, Boulder this week, we're looking at uh, 
Oh, and I just looked at numbers yesterday from an on the market. You're, I believe, 1.8 million um, <laughs> average, average active on the market. So unsold property on the market in the city of Boulder. Um, interestingly enough, Longmont just went over half a million this last week, which is shocking. Um, but what does that say? It's exactly what you're talking about. And then we also have, and then we also have a house here at the, the low price detached dwelling here in Longmont this week is at 225, which is right in that bracket that you were talking about. And, and so again, the affordable, we have to pay attention because I think affordable, it's not that I think affordable in the term has mm. changed over the last 20 years. Oh yeah. Think of it affordable as affordable if you're working for Google is a lot different than if you're if it's affordable and you're working for you know Hefe's Taco down the down the street, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's the cost, kind of the price point, and then there's also what a lot of folks think about when they talk about affordable housing is the subsidies, and that's you know something that we're going to have to look at, I believe, um, in some other creative ways because we need to have, we know we have a housing issue here in Boulder County. We have a housing shortage. Um, I was just participating in the city of Longmont's, uh, city council meeting this past, uh, Tuesday, I was going to say past week, but it's only Thursday, I think today. Um, I don't know if you kind of catch, catch some of those or, or caught some of that info, but th there's a potential of Businesses who right now are looking, it was a Longman Economic Development Partners report of like 7,000 potential jobs. We mm -hmm. don't have 7,000 open doors. Uh, we have this issue in Boulder County of basically, and the data will show about 3.5 jobs to every one housing unit. Uh, huh. Well, I mean, that's just going to press homes up even further. I mean, supply and demand, right? Yeah, so, we talk about economics, right? Yeah. So on the topic of economics, um, there's a couple of ways people can look at this problem. If you think about it as an economic equation, there's supply and demand. So if the population of people who took the lowest income jobs were no longer there or willing to take those jobs, then the price that employers would need to pay those people would, would have to go up, then giving them a living wage. But you know that's not a very empathetic way to look at things. Do you want to discuss the you know the heartless economic approach versus the you know, more empathetic approach and where we can maybe find somewhere in the middle? There's a I mean there's a few pieces in there really we talk about that and I hear I hear people say that a lot especially with the, those numbers I was just talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And the reality of where our housing market is and, and and some of that argument sounds like you know not everybody lives in san francisco and not everybody lives in new york city and not everybody needs to live in boulder and we also have community needs and we've seen this and especially i mean covid a, a perfect example our flood in 2013 was another the reality that we need to have our educators we need to have our first responders we need to have our county employees be able to live in the area, our counties and our cities where we need their supports. Um, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about, again, that 330,000 population, right? There's folks who need it to be resourced. We are still not, um, which is a separate conversation, but we're, as much as we want to think that we're reaching people online, um, especially right now during COVID, we still have a significant portion of our community who's disconnected still. Um, and so having people on the ground and some of those jobs, you know, which I don't know if we'll really get into or not with the uh, essential services, et cetera. Some of those jobs are not jobs that can be done digitally. Yeah. And so the fact that we need to truly come up with solutions to allow people to live and work in their own community is real. That's a great point. So, I mean, teachers aren't paid a ton. Could a teacher even you know, be able to afford a home in Boulder County on a single income? You know, I've heard, I've heard a presentation um, where the, the comment was that a Boulder County resident would have to make a hundred thousand dollars a year to make, to buy a property here in the County. And I disagree with that. And, mm -hmm. and here's why, I mean, just hearing that data shared out 
um, on the interwebs was so <laughs> concerning. It was so concerning to me because I, that's the industry that I work in. And mm-hmm. um, there's two things right now, and and this is you know time sensitive because of where interest rates are right now in this country. I mean, it's it's you don't have great interest rates and great home prices at the same time. Just like you can't sell your home for an amazing price and buy a home for that really low price that you're wanting, right? I mean, you can't do both at the same time. Uh, and, and similarly, but that's one of the pieces right now. And we have home and you know interest rates or mortgage interest rates at less than 3% in the U.S. right now. Um, that makes me think a little bit more about the preparation standpoint and how do we help people be in a position, right? The opportunity meets you when you're prepared, right? Mm-hmm. That's another piece of that. How do we help people get their credit, get their savings, understand what the the steps are so that they can be in a position to take an advantage, take advantage of, in some ways, the market that we have right now. And I know people are saying, no, it's not a good market because that house price is high. But I've never um, accessed mortgage financing at less than 3% on a regular mortgage. I mean, I'm not talking about a 10-year arm right now. It's regular 30-year fixed mortgage. And so that's part of, to me, the messaging that's not being shared. Your question specifically around teachers, um, teachers in St. Brain where we're at, Boulder Valley teachers um, actually make a little bit more, which is one of the pieces of retention that the district here needs to address. Um, But you're right, in Colorado in general, we do not pay our teachers. One, we just don't pay them enough. Um, Two, we don't provide the security. And we're seeing right now with COVID, you know, all the public health issues. A teacher here on a regular, um, just a single person as a teacher is not going to be able to afford uh, the average house property house right now in, in the city of Longmont, as an example. Most teachers that I know, and being a previous teacher, um, we don't typically work one job. There's a myriad of reasons for that. And so going back to that piece of how do we should, that's a state situation that's a that's another funding conversation that I believe 100% needs to happen yeah I agree it is I think it's tragic that uh, our educators the keystone of our communities the people who you know with COVID as you mentioned are super important now that everyone realizes how, how difficult it is to to educate their own kids I mean these people we've got to really take care of and um, I agree with you completely well, uh, I think, oh, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. Well, I mean, the only thing I was going to add around the education, because you're right, like people don't, people don't know, right, what happens, what goes on in a building from a teacher standpoint. But the other reality, and I, I believe that things have changed and evolved over the last 10 to 15 years when we think about, um, you know, just how society has changed here in the U.S., the teachers are not just teaching, and I'm sure that parents who are now to have now been taken on that role are feeling that in a different way because teachers truly are social workers, their support systems, mm-hmm. their gateways to resources mm-hmm. and all of those different pieces. And they have been in the past teaching to ex- state exams. And, and so there's, there's a whole lot more to it that I believe those support systems need to be, are going to have to be addressed here as we move into online schooling um, here in most parts of Colorado shortly. Sidebar. Yeah, that's a very important thing to add. But again, why they need to be paid more. Exactly, right? Exactly. So another thing we could we could talk about about home prices and renting and that whole topic is the fact that some people own dozens of rental properties. The And sometimes they're entities and corporations. And, you know, I was doing a lot of research on this, and this has basically occurred because investors with large sums of money want a steady return on their investment. And income properties have demonstrated a very reliable way to both increase value through the appreciation, but also give a sustainable revenue stream. The problem is, is that when these investors and institutions have a large amount of homes, they can both uh, control the pricing because they own so much of it, they can unilaterally push prices up. And B, it's preventing people who are, like we were talking about, at the bottom end of the market from getting into their first homes. Because most rental properties, let's face it, they're not, you know, the best, uh, you know, 
homes in the best neighborhoods, right? So these are literally taking away advantage, uh, potential opportunities for these low-income people to get into their first home. So what do you think about applying some sort of tax or disincentive to these you know, multi-multi-homeowners? I'm not talking about the pure person who owns one or two income properties for their retirement. I'm talking about people who own dozens. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple pieces that when we talk about um, disincentivizing somebody from running their business, because in my mind, somebody who's a property investor, it's either their full-time job or it's truly a business, right? When you talk about somebody who has, and so let's, and I think that's an important distinction you were making at the end. So if we've got a small landlord who, let's say they own one to 10 properties, they're most likely self-employed. They probably don't have any health benefits. They probably don't have any 401k account. They don't mm -hmm. have vacations, et cetera. So that creates, that's another business on top of their other self-employed business, right? Or company that they're building, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That to me is one, one conversation. And then the other conversation is what you're talking about. But I think that distinction is so important because as we know right now in the conversation about rent and COVID and paying mortgages and things is, has gotten to, in my opinion, very skewed. So the other group that, that I believe you're talking about right now and referring to is kind of the corporate investor or these big companies. The who are owning. <laughs> well, and, it, and every community is different, right? I mean, in some areas around the country, we're talking about folks who own um, apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got yeah. five apartment buildings and mm -hmm. you've got 60 units in each or et cetera. So we've got hundreds of doors that these folks are, um, are maintaining or, or mm -hmm. overseeing, et cetera. So that I think is important just from a distinction of who are we talking about? And Absolutely. I still believe, you know, do we use, do we disincentivize or do we create incentives for property owners to consider this Kind of back to that empathetic conversation. Do we incentivize somehow in Boulder County opportunities for property owners to give back to the community and allow our first responders, our community members, folks who want to build equity, et cetera, in our community locally, some type of incentive to give them an opportunity to look at a first time home buyer, for example who wants to offer on their home or this rental home that they're ready to get rid of versus another investor. And I believe that there are some ways that we could do that. And I think that's one of the ways that we can address some of these issues. It's not going to open all the doors that we need. We already talked about some of that data, right? It's not going to open 7,000 doors immediately, but could it open up another pool? And that to me is where we need to get involved with some of our nonprofits um, and potentially some of our um, local housing agencies, um, housing partners, et cetera, to really look at, at some of that type of incentive, incentivizing. Because I, my concern is if we disincentivize, we know how people can react to that when the reality is we just want to make sure that people can live and work here in Boulder County. Hmm. So you don't think that's a good idea to disincentivize the people who, as you said, have hundreds of doors? To put taxes on, I mean, basically to put some type of a tax or fees or something on um, a corporation who owns property. Over a certain number of doors. It depends on what the outcome is, I suppose. I mean, if you're, the tax is based on, um, if the tax is based on, for example, you've got, I'm trying to think of what would be a great, you know, just a kind of a cutoff number. Let's say you have more than 300 units that you're um I, I would say way right? lower i'd say i'd say a dozen <laughs> if you got more than a dozen units then some of those properties should be owned by owner operators and not by you know just capital investors from maybe outside of the state or even outside the country mm -hmm. so are you thinking of like a you know i think it's an interesting concept if you're disincentivizing meaning you're going to tax them or fee them based on their property Yes. Put them in a different property, like property tax, potentially. Great idea. Yeah. And yeah, from a corporation standpoint, are there, I believe, yes, there's opportunities that we could change the, the tax structures. That gets pretty um, complicated, but that's an opportunity of how do we um, 
how do we bring in a little bit more revenue? And then where would that tax money go? Potentially it could go into some of these housing assistance. Exactly. Yeah. Gap assistance. That's one of the things I really want to see is a gap assistance type of program. Um, because we have these different, the, you have to fit in such a box to get into these different programs. And there's a group of folks in the middle that, that really just need need that support to be able to get into those entry level properties like we we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that is a pretty good transition to our next topic, which is uh, UBI and other systems to help the, the low income and uh, people who are marginalized within our society. What are your thoughts on? Uh, I mean, we full disclosure, we met at a at a Yang route at a Yang event. So I mean, correct, we're, yeah. We're, we're obviously aligned a little bit on this topic. So, uh, what what do you think about UBI? You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I think I mean, there's the piece of my this concept of having people have some type of security, basically, in having an income source opens up the doors for people to really get serious about, okay, now I can make plans for my future. Mm -hmm. Again, and this is my caveat, is as long as we are providing some of these supports in the background of financial literacy, of mm -hmm. planning, of business planning, of, you know, those, and, and, and I believe a lot of that is still missing, and I'm thinking local, right, from Boulder mm -hmm. County. We have those types of programs, but I know there's a lot of folks who've never accessed them or aren't aware of them. We have a lot of people who aren't familiar enough or feel comfortable enough to really be, in my mind, it doesn't have to be the level of savvy as much as the level of comfort to be able to do some of that planning, right? So if we had that intertwined with, uh, you know, universal basic income that would mm -hmm. create this stability so that a young person could know that they're going to be ready to, you know, ready to be able to go out and, and, you know, whether it's going to be used for housing, whether it's going to be used for an entrepreneurial endeavor, whether it's going to be used for, you know, some other um, building capacity, whether it's a college degree and, you know, all these different pieces that I think is really important because right now, and I think it's worth I believe we're seeing it more with COVID, the way that businesses are going to have to be taking care of their employees, the way that companies are going to have to look at the structures that they, what are they really offering to their employees now that a lot and not everybody, but there are a lot of folks that who have been working from home for months now. And so mm -hmm. this huge shift of how we really work and the expectations from employees and employers is going to be super important. So now how do we fit UBI into that, given all these changes that we haven't seen previously? Yeah, speaking of changes, another one is uh, universal health care. Um, I know from experience uh, providing benefits to your employees is a tough decision because as a small business, you have limited resources. And, you know, if you bring someone on from a 1099 contract employee to a W-2, you are then going to have to pay uh, payroll tax and also benefits. And, you know, it's it's a tough uh, decision for, for businesses. I, I, I think a universal health care system would really improve the that equation for businesses. What do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. We have to have, in my mind, a reconstruction of the way that we look at healthcare here in the United States and new policies that are going to, I mean, it's just, it, it feels so basic that we would provide healthcare for anybody in the U.S., meaning, um, I mean, I've just heard so many stories, especially over this campaign of everybody from students to families to folks like us who are self-employed to folks who've been, you know, furloughed or, you know, let go. Um, and it opens up this ripple effect when you can't take care of your health. It's so true. I mean, especially with today's economic situation, I've heard numbers like 20 million Americans getting thrown off their health care because of wow. losing a job. It's mm -hmm. 
unfathomable to me to lose your health care during a pandemic. Well, and I think, I mean, the, the reality is, is it puts, you know, puts a person at risk. It puts their family at risk in a time like COVID. It puts your community at risk. And especially for folks who are workers that they may have gotten let, let go at their job that they were working before March 5th here in Colorado. And, but were able to find essential worker positions because they knew they had to go back to work and, and it, the push for people in this country to work, even when you're sick is so extreme and this is in, and we're seeing it now, right? Especially the, in the service industries, like food and healthcare, childcare, like those people aren't getting paid a ton. And if they may not have sick hours or sick benefits and if they don't go to work, they don't get paid. So it's, it's very tough without a universal health care and benefit system that would allow people to take the time that is required to get better so they they don't impact their loved ones or their co-workers or yeah, everyone yeah. else. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, again, going back to that piece of with COVID specifically, my hope is that this pandemic has also given some power to employers not just employees who are facing all of these frontline issues and day-to-day -day issues and childcare issues and now schooling my own kids issues, those types of things, but also employers to be able to say, you know what, mm -hmm. this is something that we need to do for the country because it's got, it, it needs to support employers as well. Because the, at the end of the day, we've got businesses who are, like you said, having to make tough decisions about providing health benefits to their own employees and the business owners I've talked to, um, here locally want nothing more. They're driven by nothing more than providing employment opportunities and growth opportunities for their neighbors and community members here locally. And so mm -hmm. it's all connected and we're going to have to really, I believe, unify in some of these strong messages and make some changes. Yeah, completely agree. Another thing, um, let's talk about your campaign. Uh, I've seen a lot of signs, so congratulations on that. Where can I or one of our viewers get one of your awesome signs? Thank you. Yeah, so what we are going to do, because, you know, we're kind of in this middle of primaries then and then going into the general, again, uh, ballots will go out on October 9th. So we're going to put signs back up around October 1st so people can go to the website, marta2020.org, and it's M-A-R-T-A 2020.org. And just send a little note and we've got people, I've got people calling me and texting me saying the same thing this week. So that was very cool. Um, I think there's a lot of folks who are just excited about having different type of representation. Um, I believe strongly that when people have met me and we've had conversations, they realize that I'm about community, community building, about Longmont, representing Longmont because I'm such uh -huh. a super fan. Um, and also really care about our county and, and bringing folks together. So that is the easiest way to, to get a sign. Um, and we're still getting volunteers together to share out this message. Um, we've got our next event is September 1st. It'll be obviously a virtual online event. We're going to talk about really building the pipeline, building a bench of women in leadership. And it's, you know, politics is one piece of that, but I strongly believe that and we talked about this a little bit last time we we talked about just the role of women in business, the role of women in ownership, the role of women, you know, outside of just the kind of the frontline roles that we sometimes think of. And how do we do that really well, well here locally? Um, because I know there's young women all over this county who want to see themselves in positions of leadership. And it's our responsibility as a community to guide and show and reach back and, and open a door for one of those young women um, here locally. That's awesome. So obviously you can't campaign the way people used to campaign prior to COVID. Um, if you have volunteers, what kind of things can volunteers do to help you? Yeah, you're right. And campaigning looks so different um, than it did even a year ago. And volunteers right now are hosting kind of virtual get-togethers and it looks like everything from a, a coffee get-together. I've had somebody 
um, get on their next door and invite friends just to, to come and say hi and meet, which was really fun. Um, and doing house parties in different ways and kind of events, activities that way. So definitely virtual platform. Um, and we've got a couple of folks who are wanting to do some social distancing kind of into the summer walks together. Um, those that have to be really small groups. And so right now for me, the preference is virtual. I just feel like most people feel comfortable with that and making phone calls um, and letting people know again, it's full circle to back to where we started. Get out the vote is going to be really important. And people are going to start getting bombarded October 9th, I guarantee, with phone calls and texts from all the campaigns, from ballot initiatives, et cetera. And so those are pieces that we're doing a little bit of work on here soon in September. So, well, congratulations on all of the success. Okay. And I really like the initiatives you're taking. And so, uh, best of luck to you. Thank um, you. Yeah, I appreciate that conversation as well because you know, small business and business and this entrepreneur, we have such a, we're doing such great work in Boulder County. And so to, for you to keep sharing that out is so important and to help make sure people know and you as a resource and truly is important for all of our community members as well. So thank you. Well, thank you, Marcia. I appreciate it. That means a lot. And so to all our audience, until next time, um, go out and vote and stay savvy.